So welcome back to the class Computational Neuroscience, Neural Dynamics of Cognition. In the previous section, we have defined populations as ensembles of cells, ensembles of neurons with very similar properties. Now there will be many of these groups of neurons, many of these populations, and these different populations will interact with each other. Can we make this notion more precise? The question I would like to ask, what are these populations and how are they connected within each other and between each other? So let's start with a loose definition. A population is a group of cells with similar neuronal properties, cells that receive similar input. For example, that could be neurons that have very similar receptive fields, so that if you present a visual stimulus, the input to all these cells will be roughly the same. And moreover, I would like to require that these neurons have similar connectivity. Now let's try to make this more precise. Let's look at these notions and look again at the biology. So as discussed in the previous section, neurons in the brain, in the visual cortex, are organized in an orientation map. So this is a look on the surface of visual cortex area 1. And say I have a neuron here, then this neuron here would, for example, have a receptive field that responds best to stimulation with a vertical light bar at this location. Other neurons will have a different location of the receptive field, but will still have a preferred orientation vertical light bar. For example, this neuron here. So this whole region here would be preferred stimulation oriented light bar that's vertical. And then I have other neurons, if I move along, which is preferred orientation slightly oblique, slightly oblique, slightly oblique, until I finally have a set of cells that have a preferred orientation which is horizontal. And then it turns on and we come back to the set of cells that have preferred orientation vertical. So if I walk around this very special point, the pinwheel, then I will find cells with vertical, oblique, oblique, horizontal, oblique, oblique, vertical orientation. Now cortex is a sheet. It's very thin, but it has a certain thickness. And as I move along in the vertical direction, I would encounter different layers, layer 1, layer 4, layer 5, that have been defined by anatomical properties. And neurons that have a preferred orientation horizontal, sitting below these cells here, would essentially also have the same preferred orientation. So here's the sketch again. We have the different layers, and in each layer I have cells. For example, I have layer 2, I have cells that may look like this. In layer 3, layer 4, layer 5, I have different cell types. And now a cell in layer 5b, this cell here, or in layer 5, more generally, a cell in layer 5 will have a certain probability to make a connection to another cell in layer 5. So this is an excitatory cell, a pyramidal cell in layer 5 makes a connection to another layer 5 cell. For example, the connection probability from a cell in layer 4 to layer 4 is 25%. So these thick arrows here indicate a connection probability of 25%. Then I have other neurons, for example, neuron in layer 3, the probability that a neuron in layer 3 makes a connection onto itself would be in the range of maybe 20%. And then I can also talk about the probability that a neuron in layer 3 makes a connection to a neuron in layer 5. And this would be this arrow here, which means also 20%. But I have other cells, for example, cells in layer 2, that only have 10% connection probability or even 5% connection probability from layer 5 back to layer 2. So, Sandrine Lefort in the lab of Carl Peterson has measured these connection probabilities between different cells and uh, we use this for our modeling as a basis. So here we have just excitatory neurons, different groups of excitatory neurons in different layers. And the idea is now that one population is the set of all neurons of a given type 
in one layer of the same column. For example, all the neurons, a few hundred neurons maybe, of layer 3 neurons excited to layer 3 neurons in one area of somatosensory cortex or of visual cortex. So this leads us to a picture where I have different populations of neurons. So these might be my excited to neurons in layer 3 of one cortical column. And these neurons are connected within each other with a certain probability. And they are connected to other neuronal populations also with a certain connection probability. And this is what we are going to use as the basis for modeling. Now in modeling, we will be more abstract. We say, okay, let's focus on one population. And say so I have one population of 5,000 neurons, corresponding to one of these populations that I've just discussed. And then I have several choices for connectivity patterns. For example, I could say I have full connectivity, all-to-all -all connectivity. This means this neuron here gets input from all other neurons in the network. Now this means that if I simulate a network of 5,000 neurons, this neuron gets 5,000 inputs. If I simulate a network of 10,000 neurons, this neuron gets 10,000 inputs. Now another possibility is to say I have my network of 5,000 neurons as before, but each neuron in the network receives input from exactly k inputs. For example, k equal 500. So this neuron gets 500 inputs randomly selected once and for all in the network. So the connections are fixed, they are selected at the beginning and are fixed for the rest of the simulation. Now if I then go to a network with 10,000 neurons, I can still keep this number the same. So this neuron here again gets exactly 500 inputs. And here's a simulation. We used some kind of spiking neuron model and we have a network of 5,000 neurons, exactly 500 inputs. And what you see here in this line is the population activity as a function of time. So time is here in seconds. The resolution is one or a few milliseconds. And each little, in each tiny little time bin, you count the number of spikes, you divide by the number of neurons, you divide by delta t, and you have the population activity. The population activity as a function of time has a certain mean value, and then there are fluctuations around this mean. Now let's redo the same kind of simulation in a network with 10,000 neurons. Again, you find a certain mean value, and you find a certain amount of fluctuations. If you compare the two, you see the mean value of the activity has not changed. Fluctuations have decreased. Fluctuations have been bigger here than they are there. But the mean value has not changed. So this is a mean value, time-dependent constant value, or stationary value. We say it's stationary activity with an expected value A0, population activity A0. Now, second interesting observation concerns the input into one of the neurons. So we have one of the neurons, we record from this neuron, this neuron gets input from k equal 500 different neurons. And if you look at the total input into this neuron, we see that it fluctuates around some stationary value. Now, if you look at the second neuron, it will also get input from 500 other neurons. It will also fluctuate, but the typical value around it, around which it fluctuates, is roughly the same for both neurons. So, the observations are as follows. We find stationary asynchronous activity. The question is, how can we define this? Can we make this more precise? Second observation. This activity is nearly constant apart from the fluctuations. So, why is this the case? Can we explain this? Can we predict this value? And moreover, this value of the activity is independent of the size of my network. It's independent of the size of the network that I simulated. Third observation. Next observation. I have different inputs, and this input is nearly identical for the different neurons. So these were observations in a simulated network. Now, a couple of questions arise. Can we mathematically predict 
this level of the population activity A0, the typical stationary value. Well, predict based on what? Based on the connection probability, based on the single neuron, uh, the single neuron properties. Moreover, another question is, can we make this notion of asynchronous stationary activity mathematically more precise? And these are the topics that we will address in the next sections. But before we do that, let's have a look at the quiz.